an oak tree. Finding the root of it, the center, takes some knowledge of all the parts of it. And there are many different parts. And Fergus told the poets and barons how it came to be the Queen Maeve attacked Ulster, set an army against her rival, Crohor MacNassa, just for the brown bull of Cooley, so that she could claim him to be as equal as the white horn bull of Crocon I. That was how it all began, but it started again before that, because it started with, some say, the breaking of the Crave Rua. The Red Branch Knights, the heroes of Ulster, the greatest fighting army in all of Ireland. And Fergus McRoy used to be the king of Ulster. But he led the exiles of Ulster down to Connacht when he got in a furious fight with Crohor, the then king, for breaking his word to him, something Fergus could not abide by. And so he took an half of Crave Rua down the king's sworn enemy, Queen Maeve. I'm sure we have many sympathizers to Queen Maeve here if we've traveled along Queen Maeve's road just to come into this house. But Fergus knew that offering his strength and his allegiance to Queen Maeve would be a bad sign for King Crohor MacNassa of Ulster. All he wanted to do was get in front of him so he could chop him in two with his great sword, Leo Khan. And Queen Maeve was the only one brave enough to attack Ulster there in their stead, in their home in Aomaka. But he gifted her something she could never have expected. The knowledge of Ulster's greatest kept secret, the secret of the curse of Maka. Without this, she would never have amassed such an army to march on Ulster. Without the knowledge that the Morrigan, Maka, Bav, Anand, the goddess of battle rage, had once laid a curse on the king for a terrible wrong he had done her. She cursed him and the men of Ulster. When they needed their strength the most, they would be struck down by the pains of a woman in childbirth for nine days and nine nights and lie sleeping for nine days after that. When Queen Maeve heard this, she was only delighted. Only this could have possibly been given to her to know seemingly gift her a knowledge no one else knew. And so, when she wanted the brown bull of Cooley, she sent out messages all across Ireland to anyone who would come to attack an Ulster undefended, to take away any of the herds, any of the goods, any of the livestock, the wealth, the slaves, the women, the children, whatever they wanted, they could take as their prizes. Well, when Queen Maeve sends a call, Everyone knew what to do. They arrived in Crocon I, a massive army, the likes of which had never been assembled, with all of the different colour banners snapping in the wind, the birds in the airs swimming and flying around to see such a host gathered was an impressive sight. Fergus MacRoy, the once king of Ulster, was made the king and leader rather, of this great army. He was known as Fergus of the Horses, Fergus of the Great Sword. Fergus was the one given this job because he was, well, getting on quite well with Queen Maeve, let's just say, <laughs> for reasons already mentioned. <laughs> now, when he set and marched, that is when the curse of Macca struck men of Ulster. They were struck down by the pains of a woman in childbirth, and they were very surprised to find out how often it was. <laughs> it turns out it was very bad. Very bad indeed. They couldn't handle it, and they had no pranayamic breathing back then, so they didn't know what to do. They were lying in their pain and agony for, well, 
the first time in a long, long time. And this army was marching. But if you look at the trail that Fergus led them on, he came south and turned around. He had mixed feelings about marching on his own province. He had been king once for such a long time. He had trained the boys troop of Aumaka to be the next generation of heroes and warriors. Eventually, Queen Maeve realized he was not going the right way and quickly enough, he started across the Shannon and towards Ulster. When they got to the border, they saw a strange sign, a great standing stone and an oak tree twisted and tied around it. And it was signed a warning by the Hound of Cullen. Spoke, any one who cannot do this feat that I have done should not turn towards Ulster, lest he evoke the fury of the Hound of Ulster. And most people didn't really know who Ku Cullen was. The name didn't strike fear into their bodies as they looked at Fergus McCroy. He tried to explain who this boy was, the potential son of Lou Law Fada, the one who had been fostered by every one of the great heroes of Ulster, the child who was at his age, managed to run around and join the boys' troop. And so, beating 150 boys at one game of hurling in one time. These weren't things that impressed the men of Ireland and the whole army there as they continued the march, not worrying about the warning of the Hound of Ulster. They kept on going. And all that first day, they spread out, devouring and taking everything they could, setting the houses alight, driving off cattle, taking possessions, finding women and children, locking them up as slaves. The light spread as they spread across the fields of Ulster like locusts, devouring everything in their path until nightfall and the sun began to set low. And suddenly they heard a cry from one side, a call from another. Stones were whizzing through the air. Men were taking up their arms to go and face this unseen foe, but wherever they went, they were laid low and died there and then, until others were seen coming towards an unseen foe. Sharp howls were heard all around. And so, the following morning, they saw bodies strewn out in front of them. Death had met those men who had tried to meet this foe. And suddenly, they weren't so sure of themselves. They began to go out in groups then, larger and larger groups trying to face somebody who they did not know. The Galena, the bright and brash group of Ulster, Leinster. <laughs> These were slick men with golden hilted swords, slick comb, black hair, and blue tunics. They looked great, you know, like they just were amazing. <laughs> and they said, we'll take them down. Don't worry, guys, we've got this. We're, we're, we're from Leinster, from Dublin. No problem here. Absolutely grand. Well, they sent a faction out to face this unseen foe, but those men, when they followed their footsteps, they saw an oak tree dug up, driven down into the ground with its roots spreading high into the sky and dismembered parts of the bodies of those men were sticking through it, heads and all. Now they began to become fearful then of this hound of Ulster that harried them in the night, that second day clumping together, that second night still they heard the footprints and howls and shrieks of the hound of Ulster that harried them all night. A third day, they forgot all about pillaging and plundering. Survival was the only thing on their minds now. And finally, Queen Maeve realized she needed to do something about this pup of Ulster, as she called it. And so she wondered where he may be. Fergus McRoy traveled to find Kukulla. And so did Fielke, son of Ferb. He saw him at O'Conn where he was letting the wind and salt air keep him awake after three days and three nights of harrowing the army of Ireland all alone. Cucullin was exhausted and he was sad to be so alone. 
The only reason the curse had not struck him, you see, was because he was too young to grow a beard on his chin. And so he was facing an army before he was even able to grow a beard. Like that man, for example. Which is a very impressive beard, it has to be said. He had a bit of jealousy about beards, actually. It was a sore spot for him. We'll find out later why. Now, when Fieke sort of firm saw Ku Cullen, he said, Ku Cullen, we still have friends in Ulster. There is still me, Lubin and Lorna, the two brothers, and of course, Ferdy and McDammon. We, we know you're fighting on your own, but we honour what you do. <laughs> but he had to run back before he was seen because he was one of the exiles of Ulster and he had sided with Fergus and Queen Maeve. And suddenly, McGrath was seen coming towards Cucullin. Now, Cucullin didn't know who this was, but he saw the brown cloak around his shoulders, the hazel rod in his hand, and a sword with a hilt with a small tooth on it, the tooth of a seahorse, white and shining and bright. Ah, Cucullin said, a herald. What is it, herald? McGrath spoke that Queen Maeve wanted to make a deal. Surely he would stop and put down his weapons and stop tormenting this massive army. He couldn't face them all and one day he would surely fall. And so, instead, why not take lands, wealth, the hand of Finnever, the fair eyebrows, Queen Maeve's beautiful daughter? Why not take titles to be always greeted in the halls of Queen Maeve and respected man anywhere he went in Connacht? Colin said, why would I want that? My home is in Tundagan, and I honour King Crahur MacNasser. And so he told McGrath to get back to Queen Maeve, to send one man, the one man that knew the one thing he would agree to. And if anyone else, including himself, came back to him with any more offers of wealth and titles and marriages, he'd cut them in two. So get on with you. When Fergus and Maeve and Maeve's consort all ill heard this, well, Fergus nodded and said, I, I know what he wants. So he went to Ocon. He went to see Ku Cullen. And sure enough, as his previous foster father, his trainer, he was delighted to see the young boy. And the young boy was delighted to see his old foster father and trainer. Aye. Wait there a minute. I'll just knock a few birds out of the air. We'll have a wee dinner. Have you eaten yet? Have a sup. You'll have a sup. I'll go on. No, no, no. This is about business. Good call and stop that. Go on, have one sup. That's kind of how our conversation went, I think. Anyway, they sat down and they began to converse and talk a little bit for a little time. Eventually, Fergus said, look, I know what it is you want. The right of single combat, one champion to face you. I beg you, I implore you that you take this because you can't stand against this massive army on your own. Aye, one challenger at the fold every day. But this is my condition. While the fighting lasts, the army can march. But when the fighting is over, the army must stop and make camp. Fergus brought the message back to Queen Maeve. But as he was riding his chariot, away with eagerness. He left Ether Kummel with him, a man who would come with him to deliver this No. Now, Ether Kummel wasn't really very wise. He was the nephew of Queen May. And when Fergus, well, he didn't realize that Ether Kummel had stayed behind because Fergus, well, always would go the way his chariot was facing. He never looked back behind him, never with any regrets. When he stopped his chariot, he realized Ether Kummel was nowhere to be found. Ether Kummel stayed up there with Ku Cullen. And he said, you don't look like much, to be honest. Cullen said, you are under Fergus's protection. I'll not fight you now, but if you want to come back tomorrow and I'll fight you, then I'll kill you. Don't worry about that. Ether Kummel still took a step towards him, foolish and brandishing his sword. Ku Cullen cut a great sod from underneath him, pushing him back because he was under the protection of Fergus McRoy. He didn't want to kill him, but Ether Cummel still came at him. And so with a great swish of his blade, he cut in one go all the hair from his head. 
And suddenly, the man realized he was fighting with somebody who was a lot better than him, but he was still stubborn and still angry, and so he leapt at Cucullin, and Cucullin cut him in two. Fergus was a bit annoyed when he heard that Cucullin had killed someone under his protection. When Ether Cummel's chariot driver told him what had happened, Fergus told Maeve his nep her nephew was an idiot and deserved to die. <laughs> Now, the fights at the ford began, but Maeve knew she had to find a great champion, and she went to one that she thought would be brilliant, Nachran Tail, a man from Munster, a hairy chest, he only wore a tunic into battle, he would chop these hazel rods and willow rods as well, and blacken them and sharpen them in the fire, he used no steel or sword. He only used what he found in the wild places because he was a very wild man. And so he went into fighting and hunting in this way with these sticks sharpened in the fire. He thought it was very brilliant. And so when he came down to the ford, he saw Cucullin and he began to throw these spears at him. Now Cucullin turned. He jumped a salmon leap and he hopped on these great spears and caught a bird and landed and ran away. Or so at their come up thought. Or not Crantail, sorry. At the Cummins already dead. Now, Rathcraft Rath Grantail, he turned around and bellowed, Ha ha, he's run away from me, don't you see? He's afraid of me. When Cucullin heard this, he turned around and said, I never hurt a man who is unarmed. He came at me with sticks. What's this? And suddenly his rage built up to see a man gloating in front of him. And when his anger came upon him, well, it was a fearsome sight. And one eye bulged, his hair grew on end, the muscles bulged, his teeth became fangs, his fingers were claws, his knees twisted back the way. One eye bulged, one eye grew narrow, so the bird with a long beak couldn't peck at it. And so he chopped the man quickly in two and howled a savage roar, and everyone heard the great roar of the Hound of Cullen. The following day, Maeve asked Kerr to go down to meet Cullen at the ford. Kerr was a man with a frizzy head and a great spear that went to the ford and he took two paces towards Cullen before his head rolled to the water. Now, this was not going Maeve's way exactly. And so she sent down Lubit, one of the Ulster men, Larna's brother. But Larna sent a message to Cucullin to beg him not to kill his brother. And so when he saw Lubit coming towards him, he knocked his swords out of his hand, just like you would a child who was trying to attack you. And then he took him and gave him such a shaking and a shaking that the man was never right from that day onwards for the shaking that he got from Cucullin. But he didn't kill him because he promised he wouldn't. And for all of this fighting that was going on, every moment of this was a time that, well, the army could march, but after three days and three nights, they'd gone only three paces before the army had to stop and make camp, and they were going nowhere. Queen Maeve was getting worried that by the time they had gone through a few more champions, well, the Ulster men would have woken from their curse and she would not have gotten the brown bull of Cooley, so she began to think who really and truly could go and face Cullen. But rumours began to spread around the camp of the men of Ireland. And the only reason Cucullin was really able to kill all these men so quickly was for the great gift of the gay Bulga that he had, the magical spear that his trainer, Skok, the shadowy one, had gifted to him. Anyone that went against Cucullin with this spear would surely die. It never missed its mark. It made a noise like a thousand swarming bees. And it penetrated a body and shattered into a thousand barbs. There was no standing or surviving the gay Bulga. And so Ray, the satirist, he decided to walk down to the fort and tell Cucullin it was time for him to give him the spear so that he may face the warriors of Ireland without this magical thing inside. Well, Cucullin said, you want the spear, do you? And they said, otherwise they'll be forced to write a satire about you and they'll all remember you as a coward, Cucullin. Cucullin said, well, I'm not here of that. And so he let the gay bulga into the water and he took it with his toe and he flung it at his head and Ray fell back and said, it's a fine gift you give me, Cucullin. And he lay down very, very much dead. Mm -hmm. Now... 
They heard a strange noise the following morning as he awoke to silence. A strange bird calls. An eerie sense was upon him. He went towards the noise that he'd heard. A calling. And when he came to a glade, the sun was shining through. He saw a woman with brilliant red hair, a flowing crimson cloak about her, all the way between her two chariot wheels she was standing upon, a grey and almost silver spear across her back, red eyebrows and pale skin and brilliant red lips. She smiled at Cucullin and she said, I have been following you, Cucullin, the hound of Cullin. I have been giving you many gifts, though you may not have noticed. I've been on your side, and I would like to lie by your side this morning. As tribute to me, of course. Now, Cucullin said, excuse me. I have been fighting on my own. I do not need the love of a woman. This sort of fanciful talk is only for an evening when there is no war talk. And I don't need any protection from a woman. Now, she warned him good and straight. She said, Cucullin. Don't turn against me, because if you don't lie with me, you'll have me as an enemy. You wouldn't like that. Cucullin cackled and laughed and turned his back on her and left without saying another word. But then they heard that call again. They turned to see the woman who was no longer there, only a black bird, a hooded crow that called. He turned to his chariot driver and best friend, Leg, and said, is that who I think it was? <laughs> oh, you're not supposed to upset her, are you? The Morrigan, the Morrigan, the goddess of battle rage. What's the worst that it could happen? It's probably fine. Now, Maeve knew there was only a handful of people that could really match the skill of Cucullin. One man named Locke, well, she went to him, but he was a stubborn man, and he wouldn't face a man that didn't grow a beard. So he said, send my brother instead, Larla. And Larla went down. Well, he was dead pretty quickly after that. But still, Locke was upset about the fact that Cucullin couldn't grow a beard. And so when this came back to him, he went into the forest, found blackberries, and smeared it across his face. So it almost looked as good as this man's beard. But not nearly as good. Just in case you need a visual representation. Now, when Locke saw the black beard on this boy's face, he thought, okay, I'll fight him. And he went down to the ford and he took out his great sword. And Cucullin was matched almost for this great skill and strength of this warrior as they were fighting along this great ford, the water splashing around their feet as they danced, they parried their block, they fought. Suddenly, a she-wolf came at Cucullin, snarling and growling and digging her teeth into the arm of Cucullin as he howled and shrieked. Locke, well, he caught, us, caught him in the side, a near-death blow until Cucullin swiveled around and dashed an eye from the side of the head of that she-wolf. When he gathered his stead again, he managed to get his composure back and fight with a fury. Then once more, as they entered the four between Locke and he, until a great host of cows, red ears, all of them led by one running at him, came down to the ford, running straight at Cucullin. He tripped and managed to kick and break a leg of the cow, but not before Locke got another great wound upon Cucullin. This time on his leg, he limped now instead, but not getting killed. He managed to duck and evade away from the blades of Locke. Now once more gaining the upper hand in this ferocious fight, matched equal in every way. They mean managed now to be close to a death blow, or Cucullin thought, and just before he was able to bring his sword down, an eel swam up his leg, 
and pulled his arm down and bit into him and he crushed the ribs of this eel and flung it back and once more Locke got a great attack on Cucullin. Three wounds, three creatures came upon him until Cucullin's rage came on him then and he grew two sizes bigger. His muscles bulged, his hair flung up and a fountain of blood erupted from his head as he crushed Locke's head in his hand and cut him in two. Finally, once the anger abated and he cooled and calmed down, he walked away with these wounds. He was struggling then, though, and that following morning, after healing herbs had been put on those wounds, he saw a strange crone he hadn't seen before. Oh, a woman there next to a cow, and this woman, well, the crone, she had one eye. She was wheezing over on one side and twisted on one leg. And she said, Go, Colin, come now and take a drink of milk, only for your blessing, please. Cucullin took a drink because a terrible thirst was upon him. And he gave her his blessing for all of the gods of his good people that they, that they praised to. He gave her his blessing. And as he did that, she blinked her eye open and still the thirst was on him and he drank the great milk, giving her his her blessing once more. And she seemed to stand up a bit straighter and breathe a bit clearer. He once more still had the thirst upon him and as he gave, got another drink of that milk that she squeezed from the udder of the cow. And once he gave his last blessing and drank the milk down, well, there and then she stood up and smiled and cackled and she said I could not have cured myself of the wounds you only gave me but you've given me your cure and your blessing and I'll see you again Cucullin not before the day you die now there was of course Fergus McRoy with the great sword in his hand and Maeve went to him and said you must face Cucullin because there's only one other man I can imagine can face Cucullin Fergus didn't really want to because, well, he'd been sleeping in Maeve's bed and Maeve's consort, all ill, was the jealous type. He had stolen his amazingly big sword in an attempt to emasculate him, I can only imagine. But the sword Leo Cohen was taken out of the scabbard and so Fergus had no sword to face Cucullin. But he had made a sword out of wood and kept it in the scabbard just so he didn't let on that he didn't have the great sword Leo Khan. He went down to the ford because Maeve was very, very persuasive. And he went down and he saw Cucullin and Cucullin saw him coming towards him. You'd spot him a mile off as he had a, a great green cloak around his huge, burly shoulders, bristly hair so that he, he looked like a great oak tree in the middle of a field. And he walked down towards the ford and Cucullin said, no, I can't fight you can't fight you and you don't even have a sword what are you going to do with that Fergus made him a deal he said I won't fight you today because you will run away from me Cucullin nearly cackled and laughed to hear this from the teacher he had had of a man who said never back down from a fight never show fear never turn away but Fergus said if you turn and run for me today I'll repay the favour to you in the battle to come now when he realised what that meant that the next time they met when the Ulstermen were awoken the general of the army would run away from him who call him, although the hound inside him was baying for blood he turned and he ran in front of all of the army now, Queen Maeve said, Get after him! Sir Fergus said, No, no, not until every single one of those men has faced him first. Queen Maeve was stumped. She knew there was only one person she could really ask for. But he was making himself very, very evasive. And so she went to Calton 
and it's 27 sons and sisters' sons. And she broke the deal and she sent 27 of them and Caledon down to the fore that morning. And they went after Cucullin and she sent a band of warriors around the ford in secret, in hiding, to find the brown bull of Cooley and drive him out of Ulster before the Ulster men woke up. She had had enough of this. She wanted that brown bull and she would get it. And so when Caliton and his 27 sons and sister's sons came down to fight Cucullin, all of them having the power of wizardry and magic, they came at him moving as one body while he was outnumbered and it was not fair. And 27 sons and sister's sons grabbed his head and began to drown him then in the water as the ford and the water was washing around him. Fieca, son of Ferb. He thought this was unfair and he threw his sword down through the air as it cut the hands off the men there that were lying and Cucullin dashed back and in anger and rage he cut them in hacking ways until lumps of bodies scattered all over the ford. And he howled and he shrieked in a cry of despair for the loneliness and isolation he felt to be on his own and for the breaking of the word that Maeve had shown and all of the Bananachs and all of the Bananachs and the witches and the spirits of the hills and the she-mounds, they woke up and they cried with him that night. An eerie shrieking sound echoed all around the hills of this ford and everyone who heard it was terrified. The men got their arms but a hundred men died for running into each other for the fear that was evoked from Cucullin's cry that night. Maeve still had her problem. Who would face Cucullin at the ford? There was one man, Ferdia MacDamon. But maybe we'll have a cup of tea before we do that bit. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs>